Sandra Corcoran <laughs> is author, holistic practitioner, shamanic counselor, and an educator who has given presentations and workshops around the country. She has been mentored in modern and ancient healing modalities by wisdom keepers and indigenous elders for the past 30 years through North and Central and South America, Ireland, England, Greece, and Egypt. And in fact, she just arrived back from Egypt a few days ago. She is author of Shamanic Awakening Between the Dark and the Daylight, and also recently released a CD of her meditations produced by Barbara Kessler at her studio in Hopkinton. Here with us to share from her writing and her work is Sandra Corcoran. As Cheryl was talking about uh, shamanic practitioner, I wanted to just explain that because something came up in my mind while she was saying it. The first time I allowed myself to call myself that, um, I was at a workshop presentation where I was trying to leave some of my business cards, and the woman literally kicked me out of the area and said to me she didn't accept satanic practitioners. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe I had inadvertently not checked my business card and there was something wrong with that. <laughs> As it turned out, um, there wasn't, and she um, eventually came around to understanding that what shamanic means is it's a very old way of healing based on changing your perceptions and taking accountability for both your light and your dark side, because we are both. So. The other thing I was struck about is Cheryl was talking about her coffee story and Meg was giving her beautiful poetry is the fact of death. And I don't want to use death as being morbid, but death was also my introduction into the shamanic world. Um, when I was a young mom, I lost my first daughter uh, after open heart surgery. And at the time, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. I was a special needs teacher. I had a focus. I had a direction. I had a marriage. But everything at that point fell apart for me. And at that time, a Native American woman showed up and said she was here to teach me. And I thought, hmm, no. <laughs> I'm this you know, young, bl blonde, white woman from the suburbs, and that didn't make any sense to me at all. But in time, I became to realize that she was a lifeline to bringing me back to my sense of self, my sense of wonder, my sense of life. And I think even looking at the past month's happenings around the world, we all can see that death is very much a part of life. And death is not something we're often mentored through or it's not modulated for us. It happens sometimes very suddenly or after long painful situations. <clears throat> and the reason I'm bringing this up is because we all cry the same tears and like it or not we're all going to pass at some point. And so the imprint of you having been here, of me having been here, of others in the world having been here, is the capacity to bring the lightness of all we are, the goodness of, we are, uh, of all we are, here at this time, because it's the imprint we leave when we die. And in all the shamanic traditions I've been very honored to have been brought into, death is something that happens every day in our dream time. It happens if we refuse to see our shadow side and integrate that into our world. And the ultimate reason for dealing with those things is to bring the light of all we are to this life that we're living. So what I chose to do today, Cheryl asked me to do a reading from the book, and I didn't want to get into the technicalities of what I do or how I do it. But one of the things I was taught in all the traditions that I've been able to be blessed to be mentored in is the dream time. And like poetry, and like the songs you're going to hear from Barbara, it's part of the creativity and the imagination within each of us that allows our unconscious to bring to our conscious mind the aspects of ourself that we can use to grow, to heal, to imagine, to create, and to love. So with your permission, I'm going to read one of the dreams that's in my book. 
As my waking world faded away, my dreamscape woke up. I feel my feet run up a time-worn stone steps in what appears to be a turret-like structure, a dark, ancient castle like you'd see in an old movie. I burst through the thick wooden doors at the top of the stairs into a room flooded with light. There are children of all different ages taking instruction at small desks. And there she sat. I am overcome simultaneously with joy and panic. Callie appears to have grown. She looks about four years old now. I rush over and scoop her happily into my arms, feeling frantic that the moment is critical for escape. She looks gently into my eyes as if she doesn't want to hurt me and says, Mama, you're not supposed to be here. I'm struck immobile, frozen in place on the stone floor. As I remember the morning she crossed, she had lifted her arms towards me be just before passing out and whispered, Mama. <coughs> Shaken, I put her down as the memory flooded back that it had been her first, only, and last word, verbalized aloud as she had reached her arms to me that fateful day. Suddenly, two monks in brown hooded robes materialize, and without comment, they each take me by the arm and gently lead me away. I strain not to lose sight of the daughter I have just been reunited with. She smiles radiantly, and in that radiance, I know without a doubt that when my time comes, she will be the first person to greet me when I cross. The monks take me to the shore of a huge river. A massive, ancient relic of a boat sits at the water's edge waiting. Silently, the monks guide me on board, and just as silently, they turn and leave. There's a row of oarsmen on either side of the deck, their long, broad blades in the water. I sadly stumble to the prow, bundling myself in a blanket I've been offered, feeling devoid of all energy. As the boat moves away from the shore, the head boatsman said, I can row, as if doing that will lift me from some depths of my sadness. I want nothing to do with him or any of them. I sit shrouded in my silence and my sadness, and for a long time the boat moves deftly through the water with a stealth of a heron as it moves towards its prey. I know I have traveled to some outer boundary, and I know Callie had been right. I was not supposed to be here. The boat reaches the opposite shore and somehow I'm lowered into the sand. I look up to where the boatman is watching me intently and ask with little interest, almost as if a part of me is obligated to ask this question, what is this ship called? As inane as it seems, once the question was asked, I changed from not caring to being possessed by an imperative need to know the answer. The Grateful Dead, says the head's boatman. <coughs> Although he has not spoken out loud, I hear him in my mind. A profound sadness, deeper than anything I have experienced since Callie's death, envelopes me. I know a window had opened for me to get to her, but that I would never be able to return. I watch the boat fade into a thick mist, which moves with it over the water. I wake up to the rising sun of a new day, the dream fully in my mind, and I recognize this is what Native people call a big dream, a vision that is life-changing. All morning, I struggle with how hard it is to return from that place alone. I resist joining the group at breakfast, knowing that what I will need to share that day in the workshop will be very difficult. When it's my turn to share, I could not look anyone in the group in the face. My sobs and sighs punctuated the story as I related all that had unfolded. When I finally look up, my teacher at the time, whose name was Oshina, asks in an especially kind voice, which was not her way, if I knew what the Grateful Dead was. I hadn't put it together originally when told the name of the boat, but now in the light of the fact that she knew I had been a deadhead, a follower of the 60s band, the Grateful Dead, for many years, I thought this was the most absurd of questions given the depth and breadth of what I had just emotionally shared. I stared at her as if she was an idiot. After what seemed a very long time, she continued, in Egyptian mythology, the Grateful Dead is the ship that comes to collect souls at the River Styx for their passage into the next world. Her words caught me and there was no reply necessary. I understood I had accessed the realms beyond time and space that she had so often spoke of. 
I had been trying for years to understand what she had meant by this, trying to reach these realms consciously, and now I had arrived at the meaning with no real effort on my part. This was merely a beginning point for my belief in, and consciously working within, the, the dimensionalities that exist beyond our everyday reality, and that for me, were most easily accessed in the dream time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So I did begin my time with Oshina, and shortly after that, she passed me to another Native American woman who would be my lifelong mentor until she passed in 2007 named Grandmother Twyla Nietzsche. And they continued to pass me to other teachers and then at one point Graham Twyla said to me, okay, the women have taught you all that we can. We've taken you into the dream time and into the healing aspects and into nature. Now you have to go learn with the men. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what does that mean? And so they sent me to South and Central America where different indigenous people, none of them knew each other, came out of the woodwork the same way my original teacher did and began to teach me through these last 35 years in the Peruvian Andean tradition, in the Irish Celtic tradition when I got there, and more recently in the Egyptian Netaru traditions. So I blend a vast education of what I've been brought through to share with people and I am a therapist in Natick where I use this work to help people change their script you know we all have things that we need to commit to we all have choices that we made that maybe weren't the best for us we've all had things we have to handle with colleagues or with family or children that are difficult and what I hope to give people when I work with them is a different way of looking at their world and the understanding that they can be accountable for the choices they make once they change their script. So I'm going to open it up this point to any questions you might have. And Cheryl's going to give me a high sign when the time is ready. So I can't see most of you. So if you could just speak up if you have a question, I'd appreciate that. None. <laughs> okay. You. Okay. What are some of the commonalities that you found between these three different traditions? Thank you. Um, I think the most common thing is we all want good lives and our children to succeed and life to be more peaceful than chaotic. <coughs> what I have found in terms of how they do their healing work. Um, their psychological as well as their physical healing work is very similar. They take people with where they are at, but they really make them go into the story, to go into the um, grip or the energy the story has on them. And then through intent and accountability, encourage them to take the action they need to change that. Because we can all have the best intent in the world, but unless we take the action to change that, it's always going to be the same. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. They have different pantheons. Um, you know, the Native people very much believe in nature. The Egyptian ancient traditions very much believe in the Netero, the different gods and goddesses, but not as worshiping gods and goddesses, they're aspects of the one god. And that's the other thing that seems to link all the traditions. There is, whether you call it great mystery or the I am presence or God, um, they all believe that there's a higher power of which we are part of. And when our own unique spark of divinity comes here in these templates, in this expression and personality, um, we are all trying to bring something back to the one back to the Godhead, and because we are always that and it is always in us. They don't do it as religion, like we break off everything with religion. It's not the same way in those traditions. Anybody else? Yes? But, but would you agree that what it is all about is primarily energy? Yes, it's all energy in terms of everything is energy, everything is always cycling energy, energy is always changing. Um, but, you know, even in new biology and epigenetics, what they're proving is that the way you focus on something is how you bring it into your scope. So that what they're starting to prove now is that 
even within our DNA structure, there are certain genomes that can be turned on and off. And what we choose to believe in, what we choose to focus on, what we choose to experience is what helps the energy of what gets turned on and what gets turned off. That's so very simplified. So it's also, it's, it is probably pivotal to be able to just open to the energy. Yes, but the irony is the energy is all around us in every moment. Yes. In Peru, they call that the Kausai Pacha, or the world of living energy. And essentially what that means is that we're given this spectrum of energy, and it ranges, it's, it's a very simple concept, but not simplistic, so it ranges from light, or what they call Sami, to dense, or what we would call dark energy. And in that spectrum, given whatever our family of origins put us through, whatever we put ourselves through, whatever our culture puts us through, we can decide where on that spectrum we want to fall. And so a lot of it has to do even within the energy of self-forgiveness, forgiving yourself for how you chose to learn the lesson and forgiving other for being the mirror that gave you that lesson. Which is all energy. It's all energy, and it's all living energy, and it's infinite. We can tap into it at any time. The, the universe doesn't hold back its energy. We hold back ourselves to the energy. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I very much mm -hmm. agree. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes. Um, I just was thinking about when we began the uh, words light and dark, and I... Uh, seem to, in my ongoing life, focus a lot on dark, which mm -hmm. I tend to think, oh, but then it comes up light, you know, once I get through it. Exactly. The light is always going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, so I appreciated that you said you were working in the light and the dark. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to be afraid when someone says, oh, but you must focus on the light. You must, you must, you know. And then I back away. That's what I think I'm saying. And I l love to be in the light. I, I just love, you know, love it. But that comes up for me often, and I appreciate that. Well, think of yourself as the sun. Cultures didn't represent, didn't see the sun as a god, but it was a font of light that could inform us. And every night the sun goes away. Every night we go into the dark. But the next morning we can start again. There's always a new beginning to be offered us. So if you focus just on the dark, you're going to miss all that you are in the light. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. I've read about falling leaves in 50,000 poems, novels, and so on. Watched leaves falling in 50,000 movies. Seen leaves fall 50,000 times. Fall drift and rot, felt their dead shh, shh, 50,000 times, underfoot in my hands, on my fingertips, but I'm still touched by falling leaves, especially those falling on boulevards especially chestnut leaves. And if kids are around, if it's sunny, and I've got good news for friendship, especially if my heart doesn't ache and I believe my love loves me, especially if it's a day I feel good about people, I'm touched by falling leaves, especially those falling on boulevards, especially chestnut leaves. Thank you.
mistakes, indelible impression. Don't care how much it costs. Never call those clothes. Barely covers anything above the toes. Reveals far too much below the nose. At the very least, know the difference between style and exposed. More challenging and problematic, our medical and legal system is sick. Judges that don't judge, doctors that don't doctor, police that don't police. Not all has gone awry. Many judges judge great. Others are tarnished slate. Some doctors work a musical score. Others stumble on an uneven floor. Lacking conscience and competence get shown the door. I expect a whole lot better from myself. I don't need them anymore. They serve and protect everywhere they go, observant and vigilant in the rain, heat, and snow. Others, not a clue in their head. Soft as a grape, more like butter on bread. Nurses that don't care are truly quite rare. Most are outstanding and way beyond compare. Every now and then, one becomes a national health scare. We've all waited for almost nothing at all, been responded to like furniture in the hall. Why, I ask you, must it take a house to fall when all we needed was the nurse's phone call? Mistakes, indelible impression, linger. I don't care if they're offended I'm a little outspoken, not waiting for my country to be all broken. I'm fed up with the lack of compliance, the loss of manners and public defiance, disrespect for people and rules set up to protect us like a craftsman's best tools. Complacency is not in the equation. Speak up and you'll see. Keep silent too long and you own the wrong. Pause. Complacency is not in the equation. So I leave you with this thought. More important than what I say is what you say. With intelligent optimism, I do thank you in advance for fixing our nation is serious business, not a game of chance, because mistakes, indelible impression, linger. Mistakes. Thank you. Out of the corner of my eye, I see you in the full-length mirror, hands down at your sides, head at the slightest of tilts, weighed by the process, of taking in your tiny frame. I am frozen by this fearless examination of self. This candor that radiates from your skin, I see in your eyes neither criticism nor adoration, just curiosity to know yourself by the features that make you. In my heart, I know that this will not be the first or only time you stand like this, not the only time you take to the mirror to tell you who you are. So I enter the frame beside you. I grab your hand and I tell you what I see. I start with your jawline, the angled and slowly defining set of it, where you carry your strength of will. Show you that the blue color of your eyes means that your pop pops always with you, <laughs> helping you take in this world. Your rose red lips are the gates of honesty and truth wrapped in the slightest of smiles, and that your ears have been shaped by the beautiful music and stories told and the sound of your true voice. I trace the thin blue line of vein just below your skin and tell you that your blood pumps in waves like the ocean. I have you close your eyes as I work up the length of your spine, whispering that it is the poplar tree inside you slender but so strong, and able to bend low in the weight of winter, only to straighten again, straighten again in the spring. I brush your hair behind your ear as I tell you that you carry within you all that came before you, that the universe whispered the life secret into your womb while you were still being knit in mine. And I tell you that your laugh, your beautiful laugh, belongs to the fairies, that it is the song that wakes up spring and stirs the flowers from their slumber. 
and I open your palms and I trace the lines of all your life yet before you, reminding you of all that is to come ahead and how you've been written in the stars above. We lock eyes and I ask you never to forget to see in your growing and changing frame all that lies inside you. You are more than society's latest standard of beauty, waist size, eyebrow proportions, or skin type. No, daughter, you wear the bones of your ancestors under your developing skin, and you will walk your family to new places, expand our history to include your present, and will face your future with all of us tucked deep within. The snapshot of the boy standing in a garden is a wash with sun so that the boy seems part of the spreading bushes, wild grass, clumped lilies past flowering, tall as the crowds of hollyhocks to one side and behind him. He is wearing overalls, a flannel shirt, his thick hairs combed smooth. One arm hangs straight down, the fingers curled slightly. The other shields his eyes from the sun or the camera. He squints at me, looking serious, worried. When he heard his mother calling him to wash and change for this birthday pose, he wedged the tin can swimming with minnows, carefully between two rocks at the pond's edge. I wonder if he got back that day, found them unspilled, still alive. <laughs>